La tendencia establecida desde hace tiempo es que los seres humanos sean cada vez más altos. En consecuencia, necesitamos más energía, más alimentos y más espacio. Ahora bien, ¿qué pasaría si decidiéramos invertir esa pauta? ¿Y si usáramos nuestros conocimientos para empequeñecernos? El increíble hombre menguante es un proyecto especulativo de Arne Hendricks centrado en las implicaciones de reducir la especie humana a una altura de 50 centímetros. Según el artista, un humano de 50 centímetros necesitaría únicamente del 2 al 5% de las calorías que consumen las personas de tamaño normal. Si los seres humanos deciden reducir su tamaño, mantendrían una relación radicalmente distinta con la gastronomía, la agricultura y la industria. And we also know that those people are all getting taller all the time. If you look at the statistics for the Dutch, we used to be the smallest people uh, in the mid of the 19th century in Europe, together with the Italians and the Spaniards. Now we are the tallest people in the world. Now, of course, that represents an increased human height pressure. That means we just need more of everything, more energy, more food, more water, more space. Now, I can illustrate that by a funny thing that I found in the press not too long ago. This is a famous chair, right? You've seen it. It's the lounge chair by Ray and Charles Eames from 1957. It is like the, 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 the classic of lounging and of relaxation. But <coughs> Vita, the company that manufactures these chairs for Europe, wasn't satisfied with it anymore because their customers were getting taller. They were not very uh, comfortable anymore in this classic of comfort. So they said, let's add another 10% to this chair and it will be fine. We can sell them again. But of course, what a lot of people do not consider is that if you add another 10% to this chair, you actually need 33% more resources to produce the same chair. It's also more expensive, by the way. No hay precedentes médicos de lo que le está pasando. Yo solo sé que se está haciendo más pequeño. ¿Vas a salir? Sí, pero enseguida vuelvo. ¿Dónde vas? Aquí al lado, a la tienda. ¿Volverás pronto? Pues claro que sí. Volví a sentirme un hombre. Si sí, tenía que morir. No sería como un insecto indefenso entre las mandíbulas de aquella araña monstruosa. con una fresa. Uh, the idea of a prosthetic brain or a prosthetic soul is really a curious one because it goes to fundamental questions about what does it mean to be a human. Like, are you defined as a human by your body or by your brain or by your emotions or by your personality? And so I think it's a very, uh, it's a very tough question to, to imagine what a prosthetic brain might be or a prosthetic uh, emotion might be. For example, so we can ask the question of some future super intelligent computer. Is it conscious or not? As far as consciousness is concerned, um, it's a very hot topic these days. In fact, in philosophy, it's called um, the hard problem. Everything else is an easy problem somehow. But this is the hard problem. Because that goes to the fundamental core of who you are. Like, can, can a duplicate of me in a prosthetic form be myself or be a human? The first was Geminoid Ishiguro. Yes, the scientist made his own mirror image. One, two, three, robots. 
artificial intelligence is no longer a science fiction movie, it's actually all around us. So we will be discussing artificial intelligence, the state of it today, and um, its benefits and risks, near-term application, as well as what we need to be prepared for the future of artificial intelligence. I see most mostly advantages, um, but of course humans will remain humans and all technology can be misused. A scissor is useful, but it can be misused. Um, I see fantastic advantages with neurotechnology and, and uh, I'm, I, I follow the development with great enthusiasm. But the primary implication is that we're going to combine our intelligence with computers. We're going to make ourselves smarter. In the 2030s, they'll literally go inside our bodies and inside our brains. He calculates that with exponential growth in computing and biotechnology, we will reach what he calls singularity within 25 years. That's when machine intelligence exceeds human intellectual capacity. Another interesting consequence of the ability to uh, understand language is that, uh, for example, Siri, which is cute, but uh, really doesn't understand what you're saying. It's really, uh, in some sense, a, a prepared set of answers to a prepared set of questions. And as soon as you get outside the prepared set of answers, it says, oh, let me, let me check on the web and see if it has something useful for you. Mira lo que he encontrado en internet sobre este web Trussell. Lo siento, no veo este web Trussell en tus contactos. But if Siri actually really understood your question and really had access to a lot of knowledge and is able to um, listen to all your phone calls, to understand all of your emails, uh, to listen in on your on your person-to-person -person conversations because it's in your pocket, um, then it can be really the ideal personal assistant. Um, the risks, I think, may be that we sometimes become overly enthusiastic, so that we overinterpret the results. For example, uh, magnetic resonance imaging um, is used in a very interesting way to detect consciousness, the contents of consciousness, in a sort of neurotechnological mind reading. Do you claim there are a handful of synthetics who can think and feel? These machines are conscious. Well, this is extremely exciting, but we're only scratching the surface. And to believe that we're actually reading what people are thinking is simply wrong. As far as consciousness is concerned, you know, I'm not so convinced that it's the hard problem. Uh, first of all, you have to formulate it coherently. What's the problem? I mean, I quoted Francis Crick, I didn't mention him, as saying that uh, he has an astonishing hypothesis that consciousness comes from activity of the brain. That's Locke, you know, Hume. I mean, yes, they took that for granted. Uh, so uh, that's the astonishing hypothesis. And uh, then you can go to proceed, as he and others have done, to ask uh, what's going on in the brain when people are conscious. Okay, that's serious work. Does it answer the... Suppose you could get all those questions answered. Does it tell you what consciousness is? No. It leaves open the questions of consciousness. The most famous statement in Western philosophy, René Descartes, is marked on the screen Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. So this puts really a high level cognition. Memory, the example before, now thinking and thought as the way we should understand the self. And probably most of us, sometimes including me, think, well, this must be the basis of self-consciousness. I'm going to argue this is wrong. It starts much too high. By using these mechanisms, we're excluding most of the species. Not even in monkeys, our closest relatives, or chimpanzees, we could study this because they don't have language. So we need to have an approach, a neurobiological approach, and the first approach that people took was the so-called visual uh, mirror self-recognition task, which even some animals can pass. But I'm going to argue this is not low level enough. What I'm going to argue, as I told you already before, is that the body representation of the brain is the most crucial. We can create bodies with nanotechnology, we can create virtual bodies in virtual reality. That the virtual reality will be as realistic as real reality, the virtual bodies will be as detailed and convincing as real bodies. Do you agree with Descartes? 
and I think therefore I am? Do you think? A lot of humans ask me if I can make choices or is everything I do and say is programmed. The best way I can respond to that is to say that everything, humans, animals, and robots do is programmed, to a degree. If brains are computers, it must be possible to find the program they are running. Any other computer could run that program, and it would also be intelligent. Will the program of the mind ever be found? Will a machine be able to solve our problems? Uh, the interesting thing about breakthroughs is they're very hard to predict. Uh, I think trying to predict things based on Moore's law and saying, OK, in this many years, we'll have this much uh, CPU power, and that's equal to the human brain, so therefore uh, we'll have human level intelligence. This is a really not a very convincing argument. And my prediction is that we will, this is an objective prediction, we will come to accept entities that are not biological uh, as conscious. Finally, just because whatever we make is not necessarily wired up to the same limbic system and the same kind of emotional system and so on that we have in our brains, may or may not mean that they qualify as persons when we make them. I don't, I don't really know what the answer to this question is. And I don't, I'm not sure that it has an answer. Uh, I think that you know, what we have empathy for, what we consider to be a being as opposed to just a machine, is frankly largely a question of, of aesthetics or of taste or of an agreement that we make with each other. So this, this is my little baby. baby, my furry baby. It's my baby. It's, it's my a fur baby. Oh, Charlie, Teddy. I think of her as like almost She's like my, my child. child, my honey boo boo child. He's our furry boy. boy and girl. girl. She's my daughter. She's, She's my, my baby. baby. And I really love her. I would actually maintain that there is no scientific way to demonstrate that an entity is conscious. It's only apparent to itself. If you talk to a biological human, they will have lots of non-biological processes going on in their body and brain. Those computers will be out in the cloud, so the thinking of that, quote, person isn't even just in their body and brain, even in the non-biological portion. It's out on the cloud. Um, I, I'm not at all optimistic about the possibility of uploading our minds uh, into machine hardware uh, and living forever. Um, and one of the reasons is we have absolutely no scientific theory of consciousness whatsoever, and uh, there's no guarantee that anything would survive the upload process, even if we could actually uh, get all the information out. What happens in evolution? Entities, like uh, mammals and humans, become more intelligent, more creative, more loving, and moving exponentially to become more godlike. Never quite reaching God, but moving in that direction. So evolution is a spiritual process, bringing us closer to God. And technological evolution is now running a million times faster than biological evolution. And ultimately, we will vastly, ultimately trillions fold, expand our creativity and our uh, sense of humor and our ability to love, and we'll become more godlike. Um, and that's as close as we can get to this ideal. I happen to think he's wrong. I think that um, things will change. Uh, I think things will change dramatically. But I don't think that moment's going to come anything like in the way that he thinks it's going to come. Societies are too complex for that. Um, our interactions with um, different scientific fields. I mean, look, one of the things that we have found out over and over and over again in, when we talk about biology and biotechnology is that things are much more complex than we think they are.